Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. I'm from California, and I was in the northeastern corner of North Carolina the day before Thanksgiving visiting a friend. While visiting, I set out for a casual stroll to take in some of this beautiful country. There was an old church with a huge cemetery behind it featuring graves from the 1800s and beyond. I took the road north and walked down to an old wooden bridge that crossed the creek that snaked alongside the road. I thought the bridge would be private because the dirt lane on the other side led down to someone's house. But then I noticed a fire road to the left that corkscrewed up the side of the densely wooded hillside that was my route. It was steep, but the air was cool and it felt good to get some exercise. I was about halfway up and I noticed an old car salvage yard in the open meadow below me, right across the road from the old church. About 30 paces later, I got a strange feeling that let me know that I was being watched. So I took two more steps up the hill and heard something sprinting across the top of that hill away from my location. But it was not the general prance like that of a deer. Rather, these steps were deliberate, heavy, and lightning fast. Then there was a sound of the breaking of a large branch or a small tree. It then got deathly quiet for a few moments. I cautiously took two more steps. Then I heard faint calculated steps around the crest of the hilltop back in my direction. That strange feeling returned with a vengeance. I froze in my tracks. I was carrying a sidearm. I could hear my heartbeat in the silence. I scanned the topography of the hilltop staring from where I heard the tree break from left to my right, high and low searching for the slightest of movement. I was a sitting duck. I just had my back to whatever had the drop on me. Then I saw it. Just the upper half of a head that was the same color as the two pines it was hiding behind. The rest of the body was concealed by the large underbrush in front. It was as still as those two pine trees. The top of the head was rounded and the eyes were black as coal. The eye size was that of a 50 cent piece and about five inches apart. I don't know how long I stared at this thing, but I do remember thinking what the hell am I looking at? Then it hit me. That has got to be a Bigfoot. Well, that's enough for me, I thought, and back down the hill I went. I heard a minor disturbance in the leaves and it was all over. I have no doubt in my mind that if that Bigfoot wanted me, he certainly could have had me. Fortunately for me, he or she was just curious. The strangest thing about this encounter is that I had no recollection of this event until several years later. My memory shook loose by reading someone else's encounter. I feel incredulous by this fact and can only resolve it as a repressed memory brought on by a traumatic event. I have read hundreds of encounters and listened to lots of testimonies as well, and feel fortunate that I was able to eventually recall the encounter. Folks, I know this might be hard to believe, but it's what I've gone through. I had just finished up with a traffic stop one night where all I found was an expired registration on a car, which did not match the plates. So I let them off without warning, went back to my cruiser to call dispatch before returning to patrol. This being said, I should have been able to see everything in front of me as clear as day, even though it was winter time and where all the trees had lost their leaves, so visibility shouldn't have been too much of an issue. My headlights illuminated almost anything within 100 yards or so, but sometimes things can hide in the shadows of those yards. I noticed something out of my peripheral vision. This is right as I was on the phone with dispatch, so I immediately cut off dispatch and began slowly driving towards where I saw whatever it was, thinking it was a person up to no good. But then I saw that it moved slowly and had a long, fluid stride. Despite having no leaves, it seemed to blend in with the surroundings enough that you could just barely make out what it looked like when I saw a large head, two long ears and horns. Dark deep eye sockets that appeared almost hollow, taken up by most of my headlights illumination. By this point, I felt like Alice chasing after whatever Alice chased after into Wonderland, except without all the trippiness and trying to find an exit. Except this time, it was the one chasing after me. I sped up a bit and tried to keep it in sight, 
but as I got closer, it suddenly crouched down, and I lost sight of it. The more I go into detail about this experience, the deeper things get. Just know that there is no car for it to have gotten into or jump over any fence. So where did it go, whatever it was? But as soon as you stop asking questions is when they get answered. So I slowly circled around the same 100 yards again, searching for anything unusual with my high beams on, on full illumination. It must have been hiding from me somehow. There was nothing except a few stray cats starting behind some trash cans on the other side of the street. I jumped some bushes and parked cars, still nothing. So I start to just go back on duty, probably looking like a crazy officer driving around aimlessly for no reason. But that's what we do sometimes in this job. You just never know when something is going to pop out, so better be safe than sorry. I'm about halfway down the block towards my car when suddenly, up ahead of me, which is now being obstructed by tall grass, I see it again. It had been crouched down again, but its head was now tilted upward at an angle directly towards me, and its mouth was wide open. There were no teeth visible that I could recall, and it did not appear to be making any sounds. It would only remain in that position for a few seconds, then it would slowly move from side to side before standing back up on its two legs. It was at least ten yards away from me, so I did the sensible thing, which was to get back into my car, lock the doors. But it just stood there, looking at me for a few seconds, until going back behind some other parked cars, trying to keep out of sight. I don't know what it wanted with me, but if you have watched any cop show or horror movie ever, you probably could have guessed what happened next. I got out of my vehicle, drew my firearm. I'm smart enough to realize that shooting them never works anyway, but as I was about to approach the spot where it had been standing, it suddenly appeared in front of me, stopped and stared at me. And dang it, this thing was fast. It did not make any noise, but its wide open gaping mouth, which now I can see contained what looked like rows of jagged teeth glistening with drool. Then it runs away from me again. I followed right behind it. At this point, I just really wanted to know what this thing was. So forget being scared. I probably should have just gone back into my car for that hour or two remaining of my shift. But there's a reason why they call that being stupid anyway. So I'm chasing after whatever it was, and I'm running pretty fast, but not jumping over anything. This thing was fast, like Usain Bolt fast. It did not even run in a straight line. When it ran away from me, it would just kind of weave in and out of any obstacle in front of it which consistently mostly apart cars or trash at the time. But when you move so much while trying to evade capture, eventually you're going to fall down. Your legs can only take you so far before they get tired. That's what I think happened in this thing. It seemed to collapse on something that was invisible in my headlights, and then pulls itself back up, which I'm not sure if it tripped or why it collapsed. Maybe it was feigning death. I don't know. But as soon as it pulled itself back up, it runs into a nearby backyard, which made sense. I mean, all the streets have been blocked off at this point. So I'm going chasing after it to the same gate that is still wide open in the fence. And to my horror, I see another similar creature on my left, staring right at me like an idiot while not making any noise. It too was crouched down like something out of a prehistoric paleo zoo exhibit. Its mouth agape, but I couldn't see any teeth. I couldn't help but notice that this one had very large eyes, much larger than the other one, almost like a child or a baby compared to an adult. And then another creature just took off running while I was still trying to figure out if this creature was real or not, or was I simply running after a nightmare. And then a smaller one jumps right in front of me. Out of reaction, I shoot this one point blank in the chest several times, which my gun did not even seem to phase it. It kept on running towards me, and I panicked at this point. Despite my training, I'm now thinking that this is some kind of demon. I did not even bother shooting at it again. The first few shots seemed to have no effect. So instead of wasting bullets, I pulled out my taser and tased whatever it was, expecting it to fall over. But it did not even react. The taser did nothing. Unsure of what to do at this point, I do the only thing I know I can do, run. 
This creature and the other two gave chase, following quickly behind each other. I made it back to my cruiser and flew out of there. And since this night, I have never seen or dealt with such a creature. But I believe that this was something that had come from deep in the pits of hell. And I know these things are very real. I've thought about this incident nearly every day for the past 20 years and still don't know exactly what happened. I believe I experienced a rip in the space-time continuum or some other less cliché version of that. All I know is that one moment the sky was blue and the next second it was night. We were staying at my grandmother's house in rural Lancaster County, Pennsylvania during the summer. When I was a kid I loved going to my grandma's because it was so different from my life in Philadelphia. So we'd been there for over a week at this point. I just needed to get out of the house. There was a small creek that divided the woods from the property, and there was a thick tree branch that stretched across the brook, so I could use that to hop over the water, and then also use some big rocks as additional stepping stones. I got over the stream and into the woods. I just meandered about. Many years previous, my brother and I had built a treehouse, so I decided I would go and try to find it to see if it was still standing. I walked about five minutes into the woods and reached the large oak that once held our makeshift treehouse. Not surprisingly, it was a total wreck and I decided that I'd be foolish to climb up there. So instead, I just started to turn around and walk back to the house. When I reached the creek, this time there was this faint white glow coming from the water. I thought it was weird looking back on it, but just figured that it was probably the angle of the sun or something. I mean the water looked normal except for the edges and the ripples almost shined and sparkled in the light. It's sort of hard to explain. Also, the stream was moving more quickly than usual, but not flooding or anything, so I had no clue why something like this would be happening. I just started to hop my way over the rocks and onto the branch bridge. But when my foot touched the far bank, I felt a flash of light overtake my vision, and I fell flat on the ground. When I opened my eyes again, I thought I'd gone blind. I honestly wondered if I had hurt my eyes somehow. The world had fallen into complete darkness, even though it couldn't have been even half past two in the afternoon. I managed to get myself back on my feet and made my way back to the house. Luckily, I knew the property well, and I made it there without incident. I flung open the door and there stood my mother and my grandmother in the kitchen. The looks on their faces were frightening. I'd never seen them with such serious expressions. My grandmother was on the phone with the police and my brother was sitting quietly on the couch. His head spun as soon as I opened the door I could tell by looking at everybody's faces that they had all been crying. Their cheeks were streaked and their eyes were red. My mom then asked me where I had been and said I knew I wasn't allowed to be gone that long. Apparently, I'd been gone for hours. I watched as her face moved between anger and being relieved to see me alive. I couldn't understand it at first because I'd only just walked five minutes into the woods. But they said they had searched and called my name and went down to the creek. But they never saw any signs of me. Nothing. I still don't know what happened, but I do believe that I somehow was caught in a time warp. There's no other explanation that's reasonable for what happened except for something supernatural. I couldn't have fallen or gotten lost because my family searched the area. They would have seen me. I didn't go far. They would have literally had to step over my body if they were in the area of that creek. It's just impossible that I was near where they were looking, and not in some otherworldly place. Still, none of them believed me and my mom was always very adamant that I do not share my story with teachers and friends. Since then, I realized that I wasn't alone in this experience after watching various videos and reading other accounts. But I'm still looking for answers. I can't easily go back there to check it out because my grandmother ended up passing away a few years ago, and after that my family sold the property. I am eventually going to contact them and see if I can go back and find answers. When I was 18 my then boyfriend and I were outside, and we heard footsteps so we got scared and ran inside. When we finally worked up the nerve to go back out so he could leave, 
I reached for the doorknob and the doorknob started shaking and there was a simultaneous loud knocking on the door. We started screaming, of course, and went and woke up my father, who went outside with the gun, and nothing was there. My father has lived there for 60 years and isn't one that believes in paranormal anything. He makes comments about the noises and had someone tear down the crosses in the fence after I told him about what I had learned. He would never admit it, but I'm sure he's probably seen things, too. My dad hunts a lot in deep Florida swamps using hound dogs. So the pack of dogs chase the deer and he chases the dogs. And it leads him to the deer. Well, late one night his pack wouldn't come to him when he called them. They were chasing something. Something that was freaking them out. It was late and he was ready for them to stop the chase so he could gather them up and call it a night. He also had a suspicion based off how excited they were that they were tracking a bear and not a deer. Eventually, he gets to a shallow but wide creek that the dogs won't pass, and in the twilight, he sees what they were tracking. It was about six foot two, covered in reddish black hair, walking upright and stunk. Whatever it was, turned back as it was crossing the creek and locked eyes with my dad and his dogs. My dad says it wasn't a bear or a man. Then it disappeared into the bush on the other side. My dad was so freaked out he ran and left his dogs because they still refused to stop chasing it and wouldn't come to him. He only ever found half of his hound pack. He's only ever told family about it. This was maybe 10 years ago, and I was sailing with my family, moving a sailboat from the Connecticut shore to Boston. And this happened on an extremely foggy day. I also remember the day being pretty windless as well, so we were just motoring along instead of sailing. Now the general procedure for sailing in such thick fog is to use radar and foghorns to try to prevent any collisions from happening. At some point we started hearing huge, loud horn blasts, just repeating from somewhere to our right in the fog. It seemed normal enough, someone signaling their position to anyone in the vicinity, then after maybe 15-20 minutes of sailing and listening to these horn blasts, we eventually came upon what was making them. Maybe 100 feet from our boat, a huge-ass submarine appeared and looked like it's just sitting still. The weird thing was the suddenness of its appearance. Maybe not the creepiest thing in this thread, but an enormous black shape appearing out of the fog at sea was pretty creepy to me at the time. I was on my way walking to the Dollar General store one early night in October 2016. I live west of Philadelphia in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. When I got ready to cross the street to where I was going, I noticed that there was a large black car, possibly an older Crown Victoria, parked on the side of the Dollar General store. The car had its interior lights on. As I walked closer, I could see someone in the driver's seat. The person had long black hair and had on sunglasses, so I couldn't see the person's eyes. As I looked closer, I could see that the person's face was really white, like milk white. It appeared that the person was just looking straight ahead and wasn't looking around. The person was moving a little bit, so it wasn't fake. I saw no mouth, no nose, and no facial hair. The face was just smooth white. I couldn't tell if they had ears because of their long black hair and shades. They were just parked and sitting there with the car interior light on, as if they wanted to be seen for some reason. It's just weird how it just so happened to be at night when not many people were out as if it was planned that way. I was scared and creeped out. When I came out of the Dollar General, I went home by walking all the way around the block to not pass that person. I'm saying person. It's more like being. It was scary and creepy. I first thought I was seeing things, I know I'm not the only person who has seen that. I never told anyone because I felt that people would think I was nuts. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but could this have been a so-called men in black? The entire scenario just didn't make any sense. One night I returned to my parents' house. I was still in my late teens sober. 
On the side of the road, I noticed a man close to my mailbox wearing all white. At first, I thought it was a jogging suit. Then as I got closer, it seemed like he was dressed like Colonel Sanders. At the time, I lived on a dirt road with very few neighbors and thought it very odd to see somebody in white on a muddy road at about 9.30 at night. I kind of chuckled to myself, how odd, but I never even really made direct eye contact or got a great look at the guy. He appeared to be trying to back off the road to not get muddy when I drove by. My driveway was about 150 feet long through the woods, and I had just parked when I decided I should turn around and drive back down there and see if the gentleman needed help. I was thinking that it was very odd for somebody to be all in white on this muddy road, and maybe this guy needed help. Of course, by the time I drove back to the end of the driveway, he was gone. I drove by my neighbor's house, but it didn't look like anybody was home, and there's no way he could have made it any further than that. To this day, I don't know what or who that was. People don't believe me, and honestly, I can understand why. It's not every day that you witness something so inexplicable and surreal. Many years ago, during a holiday in Lisbon, Portugal, my friends and I embarked on a three-day boat tour into the vast ocean. On the second night of our voyage, the atmosphere on the boat was alive with merriment. Laughter filled the air as people gathered together, sharing stories and drinks, while the music reverberated through the night. In the midst of the lively festivities, I found myself seeking solace and tranquility at the bow of the boat. I stepped away from the vibrant scene and lit a cigarette, my gaze fixated on the ethereal night sky. The stars shimmered above, and the moon cast its gentle glow upon the vast expanse of the sea. The rhythmic sound of the waves against the boat provided a soothing backdrop to my contemplation. And then it happened. As if from the depths of some fever dream, I spotted something swimming in the water directly in front of me. Its form broke through the surface, catching the moonlight and casting an otherworldly display of red, orange, and yellow hues. My heart skipped a beat as I tried to comprehend what I was seeing. It was colossal. The creature before me was massive, akin to the size one would imagine a whale to be. But this was no ordinary fish, it was more similar to Ocopus, or Kraken creature. Its vibrant colors defied reason and logic. The creature undulated through the water, moving with an unsettling grace. It appeared almost serpentine, as if a whale-sized snake were navigating the depths with measured poise. Overwhelmed by awe and disbelief, I couldn't contain my excitement. I shouted for my companions to come and witness this astounding sight. But just as I called out, the creature began to turn beneath the surface, causing water to splash and churn. In an instant, it disappeared from view, descending into the fathomless depths below. To my dismay, none of the others saw what I had witnessed. They dismissed my account as a figment of an overactive imagination, a product of the night's revelry. Despite my insistence and earnestness, they continued their celebrations, the events of that extraordinary moment fading into the background. In 2012, I did a freshman outdoor orientation trip for my university. It was essentially a hiking trip and icebreaker. With a few other incoming students and upperclassmen slash teachers as leaders, we did our trip in Ohio, but for years they had done their outdoor orientation in West Virginia. So naturally, we asked what had caused the change. Apparently, the year before us, they had been dropped off by the bus, and the group had hiked into the forest as usual, probably around 40 freshmen, eight upperclassmen leaders, and four teachers. A few miles down the trail, it's starting to get a bit dark, and they figure they'll hike for about 30 more minutes before setting up their various camps. They split everyone into groups to make it easier to meet people and more manageable for the leaders. Around this time, they pass a guy who looks as if he has been living in the forest for years mid-forties, super overgrown beard, clothes are dirty and falling apart, seems to have a few screws loose, etc. Naturally, this is an off-putting sight, but he passes the group and is quickly forgotten. The next day, one of the group leaders sees him again, pretty far away, as he's walking away from the group. This is somewhat peculiar, 
but it's not completely unheard of for there to be other people hiking out there. On the second night, the same leader heads away from the campground to brush her teeth and use the bathroom. As she is walking out into the forest with her headlamp on, she sees this same guy standing alone on the trail in the pitch black with no light. This time, instead of walking away, he begins to usher her over. Understandably, she does not want to get much closer, but he begins to walk toward her holding a letter, asking her if she can deliver it to one of her kids. He shows her a picture he's drawn that shows the location of all the camps they have set up as well as notations for which camps are loud, how late they stay up, and other really creepy shit that makes it clear that he's been watching these groups for the last two days. At this point she begins to freak the F out so she tells him to leave them alone or else she will call the police. Instead of complying, he keeps insisting that he needs this letter to be delivered to one of the students. He explains that he is an ex-drug addict and that this is his last chance at redemption. At this point, this girl is about ready to book it to the campsite, so she takes the letter and tells him to leave and that she will deliver it. Thankfully, he walks away, and as soon as he is out of sight, she sprints back to her tent, frantically tries to explain what just happened to her fellow leaders, and calls the police via satellite phone. The police make their way out there fairly quickly, find this guy about a mile away from their campground and arrest him. They come to find out that he had a rifle, a handgun, rope, and a bunch of empty prescription pill bottles with him. The letter he left with her explained that he needed a human sacrifice in order to get back with the grace of God and gave directions on where the recipient should meet him. Needless to say, they headed back to campus three days ahead of schedule and the university opted to do the hike in a different location for my year. I remember that day as a day like no other in my life as a hunter. It was a cool morning as I ventured into the forest, eager to track down the prey that would provide sustenance for my family. As I roamed deeper into the woods, I spotted a stag. Its antlers reached towards the sky, and the way the sun glistened off its coat made it seem almost mystical. This was no ordinary stag. It was a creature of sheer beauty, unlike any I had encountered before. I aimed my rifle, my heart pounding in anticipation. The shot was precise, and as the stag fell, I couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction. I knew this kill would provide us with ample meat for the upcoming months, and my family would be grateful. What made this stag even more remarkable was a large, jet black spot under one of its eyes. It was like a unique signature, a mark that set it apart from any other animal I'd ever hunted. The next day, I decided to venture to a different part of the forest. The thrill of the hunt was in my blood, and I couldn't resist the call of the wild. As I cautiously peered through my scope, I spotted another stag. It was a beautiful creature, and as I focused my sight, my heart stopped. It couldn't be, but it was. The stag had the same distinctive black spot under its eye. My mind raced with confusion. How could this be? Was it possible that this was the same stag I had killed just a day ago? I couldn't fathom it. It was as if the spirit of the animal I had taken had returned to haunt me. My hands trembled as I took aim once more. My fingers squeezed the trigger, but this time my shot missed its mark. The stag turned and our eyes locked. It felt as if the creature peered into my very soul, and the chilling sensation sent shivers down my spine. In an instant, the stag bolted, disappearing into the dense underbrush. I was left standing there, feeling an inexplicable unease. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had encountered something beyond the realm of the natural world, something haunting. I returned home, my thoughts filled with questions. Was it the same stag, or had it been a mere coincidence? A couple months ago, I was doing my nightly routine at about 2 a.m. After I finished getting ready for bed, I took my dog out and when she came in I turned off all the lights in the house. I walked in the kitchen and over to the light and didn't see anything. As soon as I turned off my light, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I turned and saw a tall, skinny, white humanoid creature thing sitting at the head of the dining room table. 
I ran with my dog and went to my room and the energy felt off for the rest of the night. There are also some more experiences that have happened when I was younger and more recently that are probably unrelated to this as well, such as hearing voices talk when I was younger and weird sounds over my house. Last night I got a call from a military buddy that he was looking for a ride home from the bar and didn't want to spend $30 on an Uber ride. I said sure I was hungover myself and figured it would help to drive with the windows down and get some air. It was probably 12.30 a.m. and I was driving around my neighborhood trying to take an alternate route that I hadn't taken before but knew about. Basically one that went through residential areas and stayed off of the bigger, more populated routes. I didn't really want to fight traffic the entire way getting downtown, so as I'm driving everything was normal. I was listening to some random podcast about World War II, but then as I'm passing this one random house a couple streets down from mine, there's a kid standing in the front yard right on the edge of the road. To be honest, this doesn't sound that weird, but looking back it was past midnight and this kid was maybe 10, 11 years old. He had on a red shirt, tan shorts and sneakers with a blonde bowl cut. Totally normal looking kid. So as I'm coming up to this kid, I get to a speed bump and had slowed down. So I was able to get a better look at him. He wasn't playing, he wasn't running around, no other kids were with him. He was just standing completely still and meeting my gaze as I'm going past. Like the entire way down the street, he doesn't stop staring. And after I had passed him, I keep looking at my rear view mirror and he still doesn't stop looking. He doesn't cross the street or go back to playing around. He just keeps standing there staring at my truck. On the drive back, I told my friend after picking him up about the kid, and he was interested. So I took him back through the same way where I saw the kid this time he wasn't there. Fast forward to when me and my friend get back to my place sitting in my living room, shooting the shit watching YouTube. And we hear this super fast, quiet knocking at the door, like so quiet my AC almost completely smothered the sound. It's like 1.30 a.m. at this point, and both my roommates are out of town for the long weekend. So I was kind of weary of answering the door. I peek out the window next to the front door and see no one there. Honestly, this could have just been a tree limb hitting the roof near the front door. But in that moment, it was like I was having a heart attack thinking I'd see that kid there. Later when I was in bed just laying there, I heard a few more random knocks in different places. My bedroom is right next to the front door and goes out onto the patio that the front door connects to. These knocks could have been at the front door or just in some random spot in the house. At this point I was so tired I really didn't really care to worry a be it and passed out. Waking up this morning thinking about it those knocks creep me out a bit more. But just doing a walk through of my front patio. Nothing was out of the regular so there's not much else to go on. I know this really isn't the most bone-chilling story, but kinda goes to show how kids can be so creepy with zero effort. This happened when I was an infant. My father was driving me and him to meet up with my mother and older brother at our grandparents' house. It was some sort of family emergency mild heart attack, if I remember correctly. This was in the south where my father is from. He's heard all sorts of creepy stories and occurrences and loves to tell them. As he tells it, it was the middle of the night, he got a call about the family emergency and picked me up from the babysitter and left right away. There is a bridge that he's driven many times before in his youth. The type of bridge that's popular in horror movies, it crossed a wide river and was covered in fog so you couldn't see the other side. My father was in the military and made this drive many times to visit his parents. He says he's heard of strange happenings on the bridge, but had never seen any. Well, this night, about halfway across the bridge, he finds a truck with the hood open and a man frantically waving for him to stop and getting into his line of travel. My father says he looked harmless enough, just a guy with a breakdown, but such an odd place for one. Dad just doesn't feel right about this situation. So he guns it and honks, pretty much letting the guy know to get out of the way or get hit. 
The man dived out of the way and my father sees three more men get out of the bed of the truck, slam the hood closed and start to turn around. My father served as military police for a long period and knew exactly what to expect. He drove as fast as he could to a turn off he remembered from his previous trips. This next part confuses me, but he claims it made sense. He believed he couldn't outrun our pursuers, so he pulled off at at the small dirt road he knew. He drove as far as the road allowed, which apparently was still in sight of the main paved road, and got out of the car with me and his service pistol. My mom loves the next part. He gave me my bottle and favorite stuffed animal and placed me in my car seat behind a tree. Then he went to the opposite side of the small clearing and waited. I'm sure people will be confused, but he knew if they found the car, he would hopefully shoot first and end it quickly or draw them away from me. He says it only took a few moments before the truck, probably filled with crazy hillbillies, drove past and out of our lives. After waiting a little, he made his way back across the bridge to the next town and brought the local cops to the bridge. They said they had heard of missing people heading down that road, but had never found anything. Again, they came up empty. Wish I knew if they ever got caught. Edit, not exactly secluded, but in the area where the film deliverance is supposed to have happened, so I count it. Hello, I would like to share my story too, in case there is someone who has experienced something similar. I am female, 20 years old, and this experience happened some years ago, maybe around 2017. Back then, I had absolutely nothing to do with religion or spirituality. So one summer night, maybe around three, I was sitting on the balcony of my house in Greece alone, when I suddenly saw a figure like a man, but white and very bright, going up the road to my house. I froze and looked at it intensely to understand what exactly I was seeing. I thought he was human, but he was so bright that I could not understand his features. The scariest thing of all was that while he was walking, he suddenly stopped, as if he realized that I saw him, and turned back to leave. Walking. Just before he turned and I lost sight of him, it disappeared and appeared on the other side of the field. I live in a field, so I have perfectly clear vision of the front side of my house when I sit on my balcony. Under a tree, I stared at it, until it completely disappeared after a few seconds. I'm absolutely sure it was not human for two reasons. Firstly, it was so bright that I could not see anything on it, except its human shape, and secondly, my dog, who was sleeping under the balcony, would have seen it from the first second it appeared in front of her. Please, if you have a similar experience or an explanation, let me know, because after so many years, I have not been able to explain it. Thank you. Need help identifying, I think it was a werewolf. I'm from Brassel, and I've seen a lot of things in this short 21 years of my life. But one time I was doing a trail with a friend. We started very late, like 22 p.m., and finished around 1 a.m. near a residential area with the old church and cow pastures. My friend needed to deliver to a woman he knew some pots and pans that she had borrowed, so we could make food and sweets for the Feast of Sao Joao, a Catholic, holiday. In the way back home, we needed to walk a long dirt road, which was separated from the pastures by a fence and trees back to back. Start to end of the road, we carried flashlights, but the night was very brick due to the reed being very wide and open. Midway through the long road, we started to hear some rumbling on the fence side behind the trees. I said that probably was a dog and my friend believed. The sound become little by little closer the further we walked and my friend stated that was a very big dog. We kept walking until the noise was right behind our necks. With that ominous presence, I took a piece of wood that we carried in case we were attacked by dogs and etc. on the trails and asked my friend to shine the flashlight on the fence and that was when I see it. A big skinny figure standing up in his two hind legs his arms were so long they touched the ground like a gorilla leaning back and hiding his true height, looking me in the eyes with his crooked spine. It looked like a terminal anorexic bull with a deformed face without horns. 
but with neck hair like a fake mane and moonlight gray skin and shine eyes. This one second looked like an eternity. Suddenly the light went out, and when I looked my friend was running and shouting to me do the same. I ran like I never needed to run before. With that thing running beside me in the other side of the trees when we reached the end of the road. When we reached the end of the road, we were graced by the statue of Our Lady Fatima standing still in his shrine, and the thing had vanished in the fields. I asked him if he had seen it, and he said no, and that he ran in fear. For so long I thought it was a werewolf, but it was so different from anything I have ever heard of. And I truly don't know that was but still visits me in my dreams lurking in the corners of my eyes. This was one of the freakiest experiences of my life. I was driving in the mountains with my friend, we were going back to our hotel, and it was late in the night. Pitch black for the most part, but we thought we would reach soon. We soon figured out that we were lost, and I had a bad feeling about something. My friend spurred me to go on because we were pretty tired and cold, but I stopped the car and got off to figure out where we were. I step out and just walk a bit around and notice that if I had just kept on driving for maybe two seconds longer, like my friend had told me to, we would have fallen to our deaths. The road ended not five meters from where I stood. My dad said he used to go work on a boat, fishing for whatever he could catch. And by boat, I mean a 20-foot boat would take a crew of around eight people off to the middle of nowhere in a lake and drop them off on a very small, one-person boat, kind of like a canoe size, and the small boat would be anchored in place. But he would get dropped off around nine at night, and they would pick them up around three in the morning. He said he did this for a month and actually enjoyed the loneliness out there. He would say that it would be pitch black some nights, and some nights the sky was beautifully lit with stars. One night it was pitch dark and kind of foggy, as he was just fishing as usual, when he could hear a strange noise behind him. It sounded like something trying to sneak up on him on the water. He turns around and the fog gets thicker and can barely see a hint of light. He tries to see what it is, and he said it looked like a humanoid figure walking on water towards my dad. By this time he is freaking out. He only has with him some food and water, a fishing rod with extra bait, and an umtitul. He said he stared at the humanoid object for the next few minutes as it walked towards him. When he first saw it, it was about 100 yards away. After a few minutes, it was around 35 feet away, and he could tell it was a person walking towards him. He is freaking out, since he is in the middle of a lake, and there appears to be a person walking on water towards my dad. He reels in the fishing pole and gets ready to use it as a weapon. The humanoid figure has a lamp with him and is holding it to the front while walking towards my dad. As it gets near my dad, it speaks. It says my dad's name. My dad stays frozen as this figure is around 20 feet away from my dad. My dad asks who the figure is and the man asks if he wants to go home. My dad then realizes it sounded like his friend, and as the person walks up to my dad, he can clearly see it as one of the persons that works with him. The man tells my father that the big boat broke down and that they are walking back to shore, and that he can just jump off the boat. They are but two feet deep of water. My dad laughs and jumps off the boat and into the water, leaves the boat there and decided to head back to the pickup zone but he said that it was one of the scariest things that has ever happened to him. It was back in February 2007 in rural Indiana. I worked overnight shifts at a warehouse. We had been let off work a little early, and I was following a co-worker down the road when I noticed he swerved off to the right side of the road, then swerved back onto the road and continued driving. I assumed maybe he wasn't paying attention or something ran out in front of him, but as I got closer, I saw a very tall, black shape walking in the middle of the roadway. I too had to swerve, but I essentially came to a full stop as the thing walked next to my driver's window. I never saw a head on it, and I didn't even see any arms. 
It looked like a large person wrapped up in a black blanket or cloak. The movements when I first saw it in the headlights were not like any sort of person or animal that I've recognized. I related to flapping in the wind like those inflatable wacky arm men you see in front of stores or car dealerships sometimes. It took a step and flailed its torso around, then another step and more flapping. Very unnatural movements. When it walked by the vehicle, it was considerably taller than my Explorer. It was leaning forward like a person who used a walker, but even leaning, it was still a foot or so taller. My Explorer was 67 according to Google, so this would have made it almost seven tall while leaning forward. It had two very thick legs and a very thick torso, but I didn't see any hair, any clothing, nothing but solid black or dark brown. I couldn't make out any details other than that. When the red taillights lit it up as it was behind the vehicle, I could see between both legs, but the legs were solid, not translucent, as they blocked out the lights, so they had to have been solid. Anyways, I drove down the road and saw my coworker had pulled off into a gravel parking lot. I pulled up next to him, and he asked if I saw it and how it didn't have a head. I said I was going back to look for whatever it is because obviously, it's something strange. We ended up heading back the way we came, and I was in front. As we got back to the same general area, I saw a large black dog lying in the middle of the road. Now, for a dog, it was a lot bigger than any normal dog I've seen. But it was just lying in the road and looked like it was dead. So the first thing I assumed was that's what was walking in the road. Maybe it got hit by a car and was flopping around. It looked like a large black German shepherd type dog, but it had really thick, puffy fur like a chow dog. I got out to see what it was, and the dog raised its head up and looked back at me, growling with a low grumble. Its eyes reflected the headlights, so they looked like they were glowing yellowish. I stopped about 15 feet away from this dog, and it started trying to stand up, but it sort of hobbled a bit, then stood up directly on its hind legs and looked at me. It was standing up like a person, not how a normal dog would appear to be standing up, but how a person normally would. It had to have been around six foot tall. I'm six foot three, and it was almost my height, I would guess. It stood there for just a second or two, and then got down on all fours and ran off the road into the trees, but I never actually saw it using its front legs. It had ears on top of its head, a normal dog-looking face. It didn't have stereotypical hands like werewolves or other dogman depictions. It had all the features of just being a very tall black dog that could stand up on its hind legs. It wasn't a bear, I can tell the difference. Bears also don't have pointed dog ears. We also don't have bears in Indiana, supposedly, but we also don't have upright walking canines, so. The area it ran to is a deer preserve, and it has about an eight or nine foot fence that goes around the whole area. I don't know where it went, but it disappeared once it got out of the headlights. By this point, my coworker got out of his car, and I walked back toward him. We were both wondering what was going on. I happened to glance down, and standing between us was a normal-looking field mouse. It was also on its hind legs and using its front legs to clean itself. It looked all wet, and it hadn't been raining or snowing outside, so I wasn't sure how it was wet other than cleaning itself. I tried to nudge it with my shoe, but it didn't care. It just stayed there, wiping itself. We left, I got home, and looked up, weird walking dogs. I drew a picture and posted it on a forum, and someone said I must have come across a Michigan dogman. I had never heard of that before. I knew about werewolves and stuff from movies, but I'd never heard of dogmen. I went back to work a few nights later and tried to tell my coworker about what I found and the rest of the guys started laughing at me. So he got pissed off and basically threatened me to shut up about it, or he would just deny it happened. So I stopped talking about it and never really told anyone else for almost 15 years. I told my wife and a couple of close friends, but I don't even think they really believe it, and I struggle to believe it myself. Logical reasoning would say it was a hurt dog. It was playing with this mouse and got hit by a car, broke its front legs, and was hobbling around because it couldn't use them. 
That's why the mouse was wet and traumatized because the dog was messing with it. I can explain everything else away except that first thing walking in the road was so much bigger than the dog. I can accept everything else but that. This is why I started my podcast. I never felt like I could share my experience without people saying I'm insane. If someone told me it happened to them, I would also think the same thing. It's hard for someone who doesn't believe in this sort of stuff to have to question their own perception of reality. The book I wrote was heavily influenced by that night and my own life to an extent because this is something that's haunted me for a while. Now some may think, oh, he wrote a book, so it's clearly false, and I wouldn't blame anyone for thinking that. I wrote my experience into a fictionalized book, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's my own way of continuing to deal with the situation, is how I feel. At the end of the day, I don't know what we saw. I don't necessarily believe in dogmen, but I also don't know what to believe just because I saw something unexplainable. It would be so much easier to dismiss it and say it's all fake, and I wish it was, honestly. I was patrolling my usual forest trails at night. I've been a ranger for eight years now, and nothing had ever scared me as much as this one experience that I encountered. Well, what I think was a Bigfoot. Doing my routine patrol on this night, it all started with me walking along the same trail I do at night to do my rounds. Being Florida, it had rained earlier in the day, so everything was calm and peaceful, minus the puddles of mud here and there. The sun had set about an hour or two before, which meant it was exceptionally dark outside. Although I was already used to this, the moon was barely out. I saw a few other rangers patrolling with me, but they had passed by, and somewhere out of nowhere, Maybe about 30 minutes later, I was walking along the dirt trail when I noticed something appeared in front of me. A dark, large figure coming from the right side of the path and then crossing in front of me as it headed off into some thick brush off to my left palmettos. Actually, this is directly where I patrol, meaning there should most definitely not be anything even remotely close to resembling whatever this thing was. Its speed is what surprised me and took me off guard considering it didn't even give me enough time to turn around and see what it looked like. All I could make out was that it was jet black, very tall and easily taller than I was. It moved quickly. I didn't even have time to react until laughter had already gone into the bushes, disappearing as quickly as it had appeared, deep in the palmettos. My heart sunk and I felt an odd sensation. It was this incredible feeling of fear. All I can think about is how much more dangerous it had just made my job that night. If there was some large animal out here that moved fast, was taller than I, and larger than I, that actually crossed paths with me like it did, what else might be lurking on here? Would it cross paths with me again? Was this thing actually looking for me? As I thought about it more, I consider the fact that if something was after me, then maybe whatever it was might be prepared to attack. Although I wasn't going to back down without a fight, I began getting angry. Maybe it was my mind playing tricks on me, but I was a few hours away from my shift ending and talking myself into returning to the station, telling myself that if I did, I would be safe. If this thing is out there, it's just as much looking for me as it is anybody else. So now, more than ever, getting to my ranger station was my only priority. I didn't really know what it was or what to think about it, but there was only one way to find out, and that was by continuing my patrol. Now I stood still for a moment, debating with myself on whether or not I should continue, remembering all the times going back home early had made me feel like a failure. Although I had never encountered anything like this before, it didn't mean there's nothing out there, it only means that whatever it was hadn't bothered me yet. But now that it had crossed paths with me, I might be next on this list of things to kill. Music that would have made me sick. The rest of my story is pretty uneventful, unfortunately. After this, not a lot happened. I didn't see the figure again, and as I look back on this event and reflect, I believe I encountered a skunk ape, a Bigfoot native to the Florida Everglades. While it was probably harmless and didn't want to actually hurt or kill me, it was still completely terrifying. 
I still don't know if this creature was real or not, but that didn't matter. Regardless of what it actually is, I'm convinced that whatever it was, it wanted to hurt me or so I had convinced myself and still wonder. I was patrolling my usual forest trails at night. I've been a ranger for eight years now, and nothing had ever scared me as much as this one experience that I encountered. Well, what I think was a Bigfoot. Doing my routine patrol on this night, it all started with me walking along the same trail I do at night to do my rounds. Being Florida, it had rained earlier in the day, so everything was calm and peaceful, minus the puddles of mud here and there. The sun had set about an hour or two before, which meant it was exceptionally dark outside, although I was already used to this. The moon was barely out. I saw a few other rangers patrolling with me, but they had passed by. And somewhere out of nowhere, maybe about 30 minutes later, I was walking along the dirt trail when I noticed something appeared in front of me. A dark, large figure coming from the right side of the path and then crossing in front of me as it headed off into some thick brush off to my left, Palmetto's. Actually, this is directly where I patrol, meaning there should most definitely not be anything even remotely close to resembling whatever this thing was. Its speed is what surprised me and took me off guard, considering it didn't even give me enough time to turn around and see what it looked like. All I could make out was that it was jet black, very tall and easily taller than I was. It moved quickly. I didn't even have time to react until laughter had already gone into the bushes, disappearing as quickly as it had appeared, deep in the palmettos. My heart sunk, and I felt an odd sensation. It was this incredible feeling of fear. All I could think about is how much more dangerous it had just made my job that night. If there was some large animal out here that moved fast, was taller than I, and larger than I, that actually crossed paths with me like it did, what else might be lurking on here? Would it cross paths with me again? Was this thing actually looking for me? As I thought about it more, I considered the fact that if something was after me, then maybe whatever it was might be prepared to attack. Although I wasn't going to back down without a fight, I began getting angry. Maybe it was my mind playing tricks on me, but I was a few hours away from my shift ending and talking myself into returning to the station, telling myself that if I did, I would be safe. If this thing is out there, it's just as much looking for me as it is anybody else. So now, more than ever, getting to my ranger station was my only priority. I didn't really know what it was or what to think about it, but there was only one way to find out, and that was by continuing my patrol. Now I stood still for a moment, debating with myself on whether or not I should continue, remembering all the times going back home early had made me feel like a failure. Although I had never encountered anything like this before, it didn't mean there's nothing out there. It only means that whatever it was hadn't bothered me yet. But now that it had crossed paths with me, I might be next on this list of things to kill. That would have made me sick. The rest of my story is pretty uneventful, unfortunately. After this, not a lot happened. I didn't see the figure again, and as I look back on this event and reflect, I believe I encountered a skunk ape, a Bigfoot native to the Florida Everglades. While it was probably harmless and didn't want to actually hurt or kill me, it was still completely terrifying. I still don't know if this creature was real or not, but that didn't matter. Regardless of what it actually is, I'm convinced that whatever it was, it wanted to hurt me. Or so I had convinced myself and still wonder. My family used to always go camping one weekend a month. Usually, this was with a group to a pretty established campground, and it would be hard to find time to yourself, so seclusion was not really possible. However, one time we were on a road trip and stopped in Kentucky at a campground for the night, a planned stop. My dad had found the campground in a directory of such things, pre-internet. An old woman was working the office and there was a girl raking leaves outside that I couldn't take my eyes off of. The girl was smoking hot. In her mid to late teens, I was probably in fifth or sixth grade, just old enough to notice. 
The lady took the money, told us which spot was ours, and we were on our way. Other than the old lady and girl, there was no one. No more employees, no other campers. We made a fire and sat around with a pretty cool mountain view and lots of stars and notice. There were no lights anywhere in the campground we had arrived at dusk and were set up before it was actually dark. My dad went to sleep and my siblings were playing cards inside the camper, so I stayed outside to watch the fire burn down. That's when the hot girl showed up and sat down near the fire and asked how things were going. Well, very well now is what I was thinking while making small talk with a smoking hot mountain girl. She even asked it I wanted to play a game with her up at the office. Of course I did. But just then my older sister opened the camper door and asked who I was talking to. The girl was gone. I told her I was talking to the girl from the office and she was really confused. I guess she hadn't seen the girl, but she did not pass up the opportunity to tease me about it and informed the other siblings their little brother liked girls now. Even the next day when we were leaving and stopped by the office, she wouldn't drop it and told the old lady I had a crush on the girl from the night before. Lady got spooked, asked me what the girl looked like red hair and a braid, Yogi Bear t-shirt with the neck and a deep V, black chucks with the stars pulled off, shorts, etc. I still remember. This woman proceeds to tell me which is weird. My whole family is there, and she's talking only to the 11-12 year old that I'm describing her sister who died on a part of a trail near the campground fell off the mountain in 1968. Then she asks if she tried to get me to follow her. She always tries to get me to follow her, but I know where she's leading me. Those boys though, they always fall. My dad is just standing their mouth open and my mom who believes she lived a previous life is eating this up with a spoon. On the way out, we pass the girl different shirt, same tits walking over from a shed with a rake. She waved I did the head nod as cool as I could and tripped on a root. You know how adrenaline can trick you into falling in love. I still think about that girl and her in retrospect. Totally awesome mom, grandma, boss. I honestly don't know how to explain what had happened to me. I believe I saw some sort of Native American entity. I was working as a ranger for the city of Austin, Texas. I just had one left of our reserve campsites when a very strange thing occurred. This was about 10.30 at night. I was driving my four-wheel drive pickup truck on a dirt road that led back to the entrance of the park. The area is a wooded hillside spanning 200 acres and contains a very large number of wildlife. So, being nighttime and how many animals are nocturnal, I was watching up for signs of their movement on either side of me. It was quiet, and I was the only one around. I had been following the road closely when I got this strong sensation. The road, everything around it, dense woods. I looked up just as a deer ran out in front of my truck, directly in my path. It was something like 40 yards ahead of me when I saw it. I reacted immediately by pulling onto the shoulder, slamming my brakes. The deer now was only about 10 feet away from my truck when I swerved, and it vanished as soon as it went out of sight. The feeling that it told me to look up subsided. Everything went back to normal. There were no other cars on the road, of course, being just mine. I sat in place, trying to click my bearings. My heart was beating fast, and I had a headache, and I couldn't explain these feelings. What on earth? So, something brought my attention to the hillside right where the deer had come from, and that's when I saw movement about 50 yards into the brush. It wasn't clear. I got out of my truck to inspect and walked up to the spot where I thought I had seen the movement through the tree line. The woods were pretty thick, but about 20 feet into them, there was a small opening in trees with lower branches and ones that were not as wide or tall. They almost kind of formed a natural corridor that maybe, I'd say, 50 yards opened up to the hillside before becoming obscured by the other trees and foliage. The ground sloped slightly upward, many leaves. I called out with my flashlight, thinking, why would there be somebody out here? It didn't make any sense. Thinking maybe I was just seeing things or it might be another deer. There was no answer, and that was it. I assumed it was just my own paranoia. 
I didn't hear anything move past me, so I decided to inspect further because why not? Calling out loudly, I knew, at least I'm pretty sure, I saw movement. And again, there should be no reason at all why anybody should be this far out here late at night. The movement I saw was more like a person, not a deer. At least I'm sure of it. So I kind of very shortly walked up the hillside, never hearing a sound. I decided finally that, okay, enough is enough. I'm gonna leave and head back to my truck. As soon as I got in, I realized there was something wrong, something strange and paranormal if you will. As soon as I got back in my truck is when I saw it coming out of the woods ahead of me, slightly up from where the deer emerged. It is what I can only unmistakably describe as an apparition. It was this glowing, translucent being, but unmistakably a spirit. It shimmered, seeming to be faint, but nearly transparent. It came closer to my truck and appeared as if it were getting bigger, but also darker and more solid at the same time. It was this light grayish color, and then would grow darker in color, kind of pulsating. It just walked right past the front of my truck with no fear or concern about my presence whatsoever. It just walked by like nothing was there, with some kind of purposeful stride without having so much as even a look of curiosity. And then, right there in my view, it just vanished, fading into obscurity. Not wasting a second, I flew my vehicle out of there, and my only mission in that moment was to go-go. Before this, I thought ghosts were a joke. I had never been a believer in the paranormal or what many refer to as the spirit realm. But after this, that changed. My mind, and I'll never forget what I saw. But it wasn't until the following morning when I really kind of fully mentally processed what I saw. Surprisingly, because I didn't sleep that much, but a thought occurred to me, and I realized what had really happened. What I saw looked like a stereotypical image of a native, long hair down to its shoulders, feathers, a headdress. Actually, my professional theory is that somebody, a Native American, has gone through this road many times before in their lifetime, and they're simply showing me something that happened here at some point along the way. Maybe they stumbled upon these woods at night, and for whatever reason, they were killed on the spot by first contact European settlers who probably had no qualms about killing anybody different than them, including women and children. I do not believe this entity or spirit to have been malicious. It didn't come off as that. It was just something that happened to them in their lifetime. This spirit was merely doing whatever some non-physical thing does when in the process of trying to relive what happened. It's a possibility that this spot is where these people might have been killed or injured in an altercation. Maybe they were stuck between this world and the next. I don't know. Maybe they've seen my truck hundreds of times out here late at night over the years, and now I'm able to pick up on whatever it happens to come through here. Who knows? Anyway, that's my experience with the paranormal. Hopefully, it will be my last. I usually walk on a trail near my house on Massachusetts' south shore between Boston and Cape Cod. I don't know if this particular place has a name. I usually feel safe, even as a woman hiking alone. I grew up in this area so it's not like it's the city or anything. A few months ago on a weekday late afternoon, I was walking along the trail. First, it just started sprinkling, but then it came pouring down with thunder and lightning too. I was more afraid of the lightning than anything. It was too far to run back to where I was parked, so there were a lot of giant rocks in this area. I saw this rock overhang off to the right of the trail up on a hill. It was hollowed out behind it, a small cave or something. I was not about to go into a cave, but I thought I could at least stand under the overhang and not get wet. So I'm standing there waiting for the rain to slow. I just had a feeling like something was watching me because the hair on the back of my neck raised up. I felt compelled to turn around and look behind me into the darkness. At first, I didn't see anything. There are no bears or wolves in this area. If something was living in that cave, it was probably a small animal. At least that's what I told myself. But when I was staring into the darkness, I saw the shadows shift. I knew something was in there. It didn't look like it could be very big, though at the time I couldn't really see much. 
The rain was still coming down in sheets and the sky had gotten really dark. I stood watching the lightning strikes and few of them were really close. But between the loud thunderclaps I heard it. There was a nasty sound like a wet sound of something eating and lip smacking. I turned back around to look in there, but I couldn't see what it was. Then the smell hit me. I guess the wind changed. It smelled rancid like a dead raccoon on the side of the road. It made me gag. I turned back to the woods to see if there might be another overhang a short distance away. It was obvious that there was some kind of animal eating another dead animal in that cave, and I just wanted to put some distance between me and it. I took another couple of steps away from the cave, and now I was getting wet from the rain. I didn't see any other place to go. Then, all at once, I heard a sound behind me, like rocks clattering. I turned around to look. The shadow of the thing inside was rising, and I realized all at once that this creature was not small like I had thought. It had been crouched down and now it was standing. It must have been about six feet tall, standing up on its hind legs, and it totally took me by surprise. I froze for a second when I realized it was like something out of a nightmare. It had a face like a dog with a snout, only it was like a man, a big man covered in fur. I could see dog ears on its head too. I screamed and stumbled. I almost fell down the hill, and that's when it growled just like a dog about to attack. I really thought I was going to die. I'm getting goosebumps just remembering it. I took off running. I felt like my life was in danger. Thank God it didn't follow me. Of course, no one believed me. But then I looked it up on the internet and I saw people posting about this thing. They were calling it a dogman. After I graduated high school, I went on a 10-day long backpacking trip with some friends of mine through the terrain of Utah and Arizona. One leg of this journey involved trekking for a couple days through the Paria Canyon or Buckskin Gulch system of slot canyons in southern Utah. The hike initially began without a hitch. It was really, really hot so getting deep into the canyons was a welcome respite from the heat. This particular season had been extremely dry. Normally, when you're trekking through this system of canyons, you can expect to go through sections that have water. Some of these flooded section of canyons are so prevalent that they are named features like the cesspool. When we went through, it was bone dry. We didn't even need to get our water shoes out. Now, what you need to know about slot canyons is that they are extremely prone to flash flooding and thus can be extremely dangerous. Storms well over 50 miles away can send water cascading down these narrow, two foot wide in places canyons and giant walls over 100 feet high. Not a lot of wiggle room for torrents of water or for a hiker trying to feebly run away from the wall of death behind them. A morbid reminder is the presence of these giant logs wedged between the canyon walls, dozens of feet above you, indicating the height to which flood levels rise. This also means you can't set up camp just anywhere. It is vital you find a sandbar elevated above the floor of the canyon and the sparse sections where the canyon widens out, just in case you're unlucky and a transient flood just so happens to pass through. You can tell it to be safe by the presence of vegetation growing on the tops, unable to be washed away by floods. But as I said, it had been really dry up to that point, so we weren't really worried about that. When we stopped for lunch about halfway through the trek, I looked up and noticed little cute cumulus clouds floating by. The deserts are known for their random thunderstorms. As we continued walking, the sky began becoming less and less blue percentage-wise, instead filling up with more and more gray. As it became overcast, there was a true sense of despair rising up within me. Total helplessness. In this sort of situation, you have no control. There is nowhere to go, nowhere to run. I felt this vividly sad sense of acceptance, like as if a judge had sentenced me to death to be carried out that day, with no chance to tie up any loose ends in my life. This whole time my friends were oblivious to the dangers and were joking, which made me feel worse due to the extreme juxtaposition of the situation. But I didn't really want to ruin their fun. And then it started drizzling. You know when people jokingly say they were so scared they shit their pants. As soon as I felt the drops on my cheeks, 
my bowels were seriously coming loose. That feeling of first date nervousness times 1000. I actually had to stop walking to regain composure and control of the muscles responsible for that function. At this point I pointed it out to my friends and the march down the canyon became a lot more serious. The drizzle continued for 20 minutes and this whole time I was listening intently to either ends of the canyon for the inevitable roar signaling our doom, fervently looking for little green islands of safety. Thankfully, the drizzle abated and the task at hand was to find a place to rest our poor bodies. But finally, after a physically exhausting trek of 22 miles in the sand, made mentally exhausting by failed pack winching up rock falls resulting in major loss of water, and most of all the surreal drizzle scare, we finally reached a section of land that could accommodate all of us about 10-ish. Too happy to put the trials of the day behind us, we wasted no time in getting dinner prepared and getting ready to turn in for the night. Little did we know. This was the start of the most bone-chilling experience I have ever had. To this day, just the memory of it evokes a goosebump reaction similar to that which you get in horror movies. As we lay in our tents, one of my friends told us all to shoot up and listen to something he heard coming from one end of the canyon. He said that it sounded like a R whistle. Sure enough, there was some shrill noise faintly coming from where we had just trekked. We kind of wondered what the noise could be, and we thought maybe someone needed help. Maybe they broke an ankle or were cornered by an animal. I jokingly threw out the possibility that maybe it was the ghosts of the Native Americans angry at us for disturbing some sacred ground of theirs, and the sounds were of them tracking us through the canyon. Then a friend suggested maybe due to the shrill nature of the noise, it was a banshee stalking us. As we were discussing the possibilities, I heard something coming from the other end of the canyon. I pointed it out to the other guys, and as we fell silent, I could immediately tell it wasn't an echo due to the noise being in a completely different register, yet still very shrill. However, it was still rather faint. But then a third noise popped up, and a fourth. And all the while the noises were getting louder, and louder, and louder, and louder. As it got louder, it became far more human-like, but extremely angry. We were all scared shitless at this point completely seriously referring to these noises as banshees. These sounds got so loud that eventually we couldn't hear ourselves talk, and the sound penetrated through our skulls into our thoughts. An endless barrage of extremely high-pitched screaming, yet with it all seemingly completely in harmony and slowly undulating like the breath of the ocean. It took up all sensation and all feeling. The moonlit night flooded this canyon with light, revealing the patterns created by dark streaks on the sandstone walls. After a while, the fear subsided, and the noise, with its extremely pervasive quality, along with the scenery, completely freed me from my mind's stream of conscious thought that was the source of all worry. It was hauntingly beautiful the way I remember it, and this otherworldly sound we experienced in nature is what brings back the chills every time I think of it. As weird as it sounds, I am so thankful to have had experienced them. I will remember them as long as I live. If anyone is able to find sources of this sound, I will be forever grateful. My friend recorded it, but lost his phone a couple months after the trip, and everyone I have asked since can't identify what may have caused this sound. I want to hear them again and relive that experience. Years ago, I lived at a cabin with my husband and young child, three-year-old, and one dog. The layout of the house plays a role. The front door lead to the living room, and there was a small hallway that led to kitchen and our kids' room off to the right. In the hallway, there was a bathroom L and main bedroom R off it. Our dog used to sleep in the hallway. It was late, and my husband and kid were sleeping. I had been in the living room watching TV. I had heard a noise like a whine or like I was being called, and it made me jump. It was weird. It was sounding like my kid, but not really. But at that point, I had just assumed it was her. So I had walked down the hallway. The dog was sitting up staring at my kid's room. So I stepped around her and walked over to my kid's room. My child was sitting straight up, looking straight, not making a noise. I laid her back down and went back towards the living room. Again, I heard the same odd 
hard to describe noise and walked back down to her room. Again, the same thing. The dog looked on edge as well. I stayed up for a little while to make sure she has gone back to sleep and to get dog to relax. I eventually went into the bedroom and laid down. Still, my ears were on high alert given the circumstances. I laid there for a while trying to sleep, but it seemed like something was stopping me from relaxing enough to actually fall asleep. I tossed and turned a bit. I had been laying on my right side facing my closet, and when I rolled back onto my back, I saw something that has forever stayed with me. I legit see it so clearly as I write this. At the end of my bed stood a small boy, probably seven or eight. My eyes literally couldn't blink. I was shocked but not terrified like most would think. I was bewildered because I could see him clear as day. Young boy with a hat and tannish clothes with suspenders. I swear on everything he said something, and I turned away because now I thought I was losing my mind. Not only could I see him clear as day, but now I could hear him speaking. It sounded like help. I rolled back toward the closet and closed my eyes real tight and was hoping he'd disappear. But nope, I was wrong. When I opened my eyes, he was now standing directly in front of my face. Like I said, he was 78, so his face was right in front of mine when I opened my eyes. While looking this boy straight in the face, he said something, and all I could think of was the TV shows that say all you have to do is tell them to leave and it's okay to move on. So I had reopened my eyes hoping he was gone, and as I went to say it's okay to pass on, and to please leave my home. I got 99% of it out and I said the last word. I clearly heard him and watched him raise his rigged hand slightly and said, no wait, and when I blinked he was gone. Scared shitless I got up checked my kid's room she was fast asleep. My dog was relaxed now asleep in the hallway and nothing seemed weird anymore. I laid back down freaked out and thinking I was going crazy. At some point I fell asleep. The next day I told my husband and best friend. My boyfriend completely was taken aback by it and how out of this world it was and my husband was shocked he didn't hurt anything while it was happening. The image of this boy has stayed with me ever since. I googled the property that I was living in at that point to see if any children who looked like him had gone missing and never could uncover anything shady. The property was at the location of a war that was fought and there were a couple youngins who had gone missing but nothing concrete. I've had random odd things happen like feeling someone run my head from behind, but this, this is something that has always stayed with me. His face is just as detailed today as it was over a decade ago. I attached a pic of a boy wearing a similar type outfit as the boy that I had saw. I went on a GAP semester as part of a cohort of 15 students in the Wind River mountain range for 26 days. We were doing a NOLS course without technology for a learning requirement for first year students. Awesome opportunity. Anyway, it was getting late and our LOD leader of the day was upset because it was getting dark out and this was the final stretch in a group of five. We were split into packs of five near the end. So we happened upon a tucked in corner at a high altitude that looked to be an old camp. By this point, it was too dark to carry on, so we scouted out the area. It was unsettling because there were bear traps everywhere. There was no sign of life, but a distinct humming noise was omnipresent. Out of curiosity, I walked into a tent with a friend, and there were three rusty chainsaws and a rotting leg of some animal. It smelled awful. There was no food, except for a few cans that had expired three years prior, but the humming got louder. There was also a video camera inside with a note on the ground that read, I haven't forgotten. At that point, we decided to leave really fast and traveled three more miles to distance ourselves. Those three miles with nothing but flashlights in the pitch dark was one of the most nerve-wracking times of my life. It may have honestly been nothing, but five guys who had to get to the final landing point in three days without seeing people for a week was enough. I marked the approximate coordinates on my map at the time, and I may have it in my desk at home. I'll try to post it if I find it when I'm on break.
I'm a 22-year-old archery hunter that lives in and hunts Nevada. I still hunt to this day, but this is something that definitely shook me up back in the summer of 2017. I was mule deer hunting, and after a long hot summer day of hiking and searching, I had finally spotted some deer across the canyon that had bedded down under the shade of a thick mahogany tree patch on top of the opposite mountains from me. The sun was setting, and since I lacked the time to make a multiple-hour sneak, I decided I would return to camp and hike up early the next morning while it was still dark so I could have a good chance at spotting them going down to water at first light. At about 3 a.m. completely dark still, I headed out of camp and up into the darkness with my bow and pack. At first the ascent up the mountainside was wide open sage country and was somewhat lit by a full moon and an incredible showing of stars so I opted to not turn on my headlamp and to walk amongst the stars. Once I had gotten to the ridge line, I was faced with a thick row of mahogany trees that followed the whole ridge up to the peak. The transition from vast, open, starlit, sage-covered mountainside to the enclosed mahogany canopy was like entering another world. Anyone who's been in a thick mahogany or aspen patch knows how. Confined it can feel. It was already dark, but it was another level of dark and quiet under the thick mahogany canopy. I turned on the headlamp and ventured into the thick mahogany patch. A nighttime hike like this was nothing new for me, but after about the first half mile in that confined, dark, completely quiet, mahogany jungle something just felt wrong. The type of wrong that makes neck hairs stand up and sends tingles through your body. I nervously covered the next few miles with only a few breaks. About half an hour before sunrise I made it the spot, sat down in the darkness and waited quietly with my binoculars for the sun to rise. The sun rose and the deer were nowhere to be found. It was a disappointing morning sitting on the mountaintop looking through my binoculars for the deer to no avail. At about noon I decided it was time to head back to camp and regroup. I started back into the mahoganies to find my tracks to follow back to camp. As soon as I found my tracks, I noticed something that made my blood run cold. Alongside and even inside my boot prints. Massive mountain lion tracks. The mountain lion tracks ran the entire length of my three-mile nighttime hike I had done just a few hours before. The lion tracks even circled and paced around the spots I had taken my breaks at. Less than ten yards away from where I would have been resting. I had been stalked in complete darkness for more than two hours, and the entirety of three miles by a 200-plus pound. Predator that can crush my skull with a single bite, all without having the slightest clue it was there. Maybe this doesn't belong here, and maybe it isn't much of a story. It has the advantage or disadvantage of being true. About a year ago, my mother died suddenly of a brain hemorrhage. There were no warnings, no signs. She was quite young. My sister and I found her body slumped over in the bathroom. I spent much of the next few months in a haze of grief and drunkenness. I slept little and dreamt less. The few dreams I did have were vivid and strange. My mother's voice calling from the dark. She was puzzled and incredulous when I tried to tell her that she was dead. One dream in particular stays with me. In this dream, my mother was not enshadowed in dark, but shining with brilliant light. She looked younger and more carefree than I had seen her in a long time. She smiled when she saw me, and I ran to hug her. I asked her how she was doing. She laughed and said she was at peace. Then she grew a bit more serious. She told me not to worry about her. It was me she was worried about. She could see the state I was in. She told me that she wanted me to feel the peace she was feeling. She told me I should join her where she was. Her voice remained light and loving. I backed away a few paces from her. What are you saying, Mom? I asked. Come on, sweetie, she said. You're a drunken, miserable loser. What do you have to look forward to? Just do it. It'll be quick and easy. Over before you know it. I shook my head. You're not mom, I said, and then the thing wearing my mother's skin grinned at me, a big, gleaming rictus like a mouth being forced open with fish hooks. It shot me a little wave, and then it disappeared. Then I woke up. 
I'm doing better now. I'm drinking less. I'm in therapy and I have my family support. Life is good. I just hope that I never have to see that smile again. I was hoping you may be able to help. My research partner and me have a bit of a problem with a dogman at his cabin here in southeast Ohio. We have been researching the Ohio grassmen for about two years together. Well, now we have this dogman really becoming a problem. Since January 3rd of this year, this thing has been pissing on his cabin about four feet up in various spots. It has taken a frontal bite out one of his trees, it slashed one of them. It hangs out in the wee hours most nights growling all around his cabin. We have it on video, audio SND trail cam, so we know what we are dealing with. We are just asking for some advice on how to deal with it. This place where his cabin is, is a campground that is primarily closed for the winter. There are a handful of year-round residents, but a total of maybe eight. It is opening up for the season now and we don't want anyone getting hurt. It is more of an upright dog than a wolf. He is getting more aggressive with time. My partner being an ex-army ranger does not scare easily, but this thing finally wore him out to the point he left his cabin and went back to his homestead to regroup. Our thinking at the moment is to try SND take it out. We started on a plan that we think will work. Problem being, we think there is more than one. There are grassmen all around this area. We have them on audio and photos, but neither is deterring the others. Any advice you have would be greatly appreciated. We don't really want to kill it, but it's getting to that point. We also don't want to draw attention to the area. The last thing we want is a bunch of people running around looking for it. Thanks for your time. My mother just told me that a few days ago, on her way to work at 5 a.m., she saw a red eye shine in the corner of her eye from her headlights. She tried to look at what had caused it, but what she saw made her shiver. The creature was about my father's height, which is six feet or more, and had turned towards the cornfield after looking at my mother's vehicle from the side of the road. As she passed it, all she could see was the back end. She described it as a naked man with dark gray or black wolf-like hair with no tail. After she passed it, she kept watching it and saw it turn its head to look at her, but it did not turn its body, unlike how a Bigfoot would. Its body remained still. She said she saw incredible intelligence, but also felt an evil presence. A few months prior, on my way home from work at 11.30 p.m., I saw a red eye shine, and then a large creature sped across the road about 3,000-4,000 yards in front of me. It had black fur, a long muzzle with a large head, broad shoulders with what seemed like a mane around it, large and long front and back legs at a strange angle, and no tail. When it happened, the first thing that came to my mind was an impossible mix between a wolf and a wild boar. At the time, I didn't know about the dogman, but after learning about it, that's what I believed that creature had to be. All of these incidents occurred in Morrow County, Ohio. Another sighting happened last week outside of Mount Vernon, Knox County, Ohio, about 35-45 miles from our house. I'm from a small Midwestern town. Nothing like what I saw happens here to my knowing, and is pretty much completely normal. This took place in fall of my seventh grade, so around 2016-2017. Even though it was a few years ago, I know that I saw something, but I'm not 100% sure what I saw. By the way, I'm telling this in first person simply because it's easier. Kylie, my mom, called up the stairs. I quickly went towards her voice as she began to explain. Your dad and I are heading out for the night. She clipped in a gold earring. Do you mind walking the dog before we leave? I simply nodded in response. Clipping in the dog's leash as she continued talking about what they were doing that night. It was late November night and the sun had already set. By the time my mom finished talking and the dog was clipped in and ready to go. I closed the front door and immediately felt chills not only from the temperature but the atmosphere. Not one person was out. It not that late is it? 
I said to my dog with no response. I had made it half a street when my dog had stopped to sniff something on the ground. I looked out at the road ahead, nothing but houses and one stop sign. My brain immediately thought back to a dumb video my friend and I watched trying to scare ourselves in class. We're just like me, someone walking looks up at a stop sign to see a woman staring back at them, literally standing on the stop sign. I'm no one, I say looking down from the bold red sign. I still couldn't shake a creepy feeling as I looked down the road. My heart stopped. I'll try my best to describe the horrifying sight I saw. Looking back at me was about an eight, nine feet tall shadowy figure. Something with two legs tall and skinny. Arms even longer reaching the ground but just as skinny. The body round completed with a long skinny neck and no face. Once again I say no face. I was purely terrified. I pulled my dog to run but she was frozen. I yelled out to her, making it hear then see me in the process. It began to follow us. In what I can only call a drunk on a tightrope walk. In response I ran with all my night, cutting through my neighbor's backyard in the process. I slipped and fell all while running on the muddy grass. I turned around picking up my dog in one motion. It was even closer now. My head was pounding as I ran with tears in my eyes. Turning around I fixed my grip on the dog and ran for my life. I opened my back door, throwing us inside. It's going to get me. I yell as my parents run to me. Thank God they hadn't left yet. Truly believing I was almost kidnapped, my dad ran outside. I sat for the next few minutes sobbing, trying to explain the events that just occurred to my mom. My Ada walked in through the back door and simply said there's no one. Ever since that day I've had terrible problems with anxiety and depression. To be fair it could have nothing to do with what I saw. But I have to think a small part of it was from the pure terror I saw that day. My name is of no importance, for I am a CIA operative and anonymity is my shield. Today I find myself compelled to share a true story, one that defies explanation and haunts my thoughts to this day. And so I have chosen to submit my account to your YouTube channel, hoping to find solace in the collective disbelief of others. So it all began when I was deployed to the war-torn African nation of Congo. My mission was clear, infiltrate a terrorist organization and gather vital intelligence regarding their plans for a possible chemical attack on a major city. The gravity of the task at hand weighed heavily upon my shoulders, and the stakes were as high as they could be. As an agent of the CIA, I had witnessed my fair share of atrocities and the horrors of war. Africa was something else. It was a place consumed by chaos and despair, ravaged by years of conflict. Yet amidst the devastation, something else lurked, something far more inexplicable. One fateful night, while on patrol deep within the dense woods, a feeling of unease settled upon me. The darkness was impenetrable. Suddenly, as if emerging from the very shadows themselves, I saw it. A creature, resembling something akin to a yeti, stood before me. Its unkempt brown hair hung loosely, swaying in the slight breeze. Its eyes, a piercing yellow glow, fixated on me with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. I watched in awe as it sniffed the air, its grotesque form devoid of a nose or mouth. It stood upright on two legs, a bipedal enigma that defied all logical explanation. Time stood still as I observed this inexplicable sight. But just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature vanished into nearby woods. I was left standing there, heart pounding and mind racing to comprehend the impossible. The rational part of me insisted. It was a hallucination or a figment of my exhausted imagination. But deep down, I knew what I had witnessed was real. Seeking answers, I approached the locals the following day, inquiring about any known wildlife that matched the description of the creature I had seen. To my bewilderment, they shook their heads in confusion. They told me there were no such animals in those parts. No wild creatures with brown hair and glowing yellow eyes. It was as if the creature existed only within the boundaries of my perception. Now as I sit here, sharing my account with you, I am plagued by a maelstrom of questions. What was that creature? 
Was it a mere anomaly, a result of my mind playing tricks on me? Or was it something more, something that lurked in the depths of the unexplored, waiting to be discovered? My friend and I, both 18-year-old males at the time, decided to go camping in the Mogollon Rim of northern Arizona. We had no particular spot in mind as to where to camp, so we drove around the NF woods until we came across a small, very secluded lake. I literally brought everything a guy would need to be out camping in the wilderness. Sleeping bags, lighter, food, knife, etc. Except I had forgotten my brand new Coleman tent, I purchased specifically for this adventure. So we wound up just camping in our sleeping bags on the ground next to the fire. It took forever to fall asleep because the temperatures dropped below freezing and we were shaking. We went based off the weather for Payson, Arizona, which was 4,000 feet and 50 miles from where we actually laid camp. My friend will call in Tom fell asleep before I did. I can't remember if ever did fall asleep or if I was just half asleep. But around midnight, I start hearing some really weird noises in the distance. I knew their elk buggling nearby, so I didn't think much of it. Gradually, a snapping sound kept getting closer and closer to the camp over the course of about a half hour. I started getting scared, hoping it would go away, but it didn't. Suddenly, on the side of camp closest to Tom, I hear something running through the meadow straight toward us. I jumped up so fast and yelled at Tom to get up. While I was yelling at him, I was searching the ground nearby for my .40 caliber handgun. By the time I got the gun and flashlight trained on Tom, there is was massive black bear standing right above him. Tom was trying to get up having realized there was in fact a bear hovering above him. I aimed in the direction of the bear and squeezed the trigger four times. I could hear the bear run off not knowing whether I hit it or not. We were shaking so fiercely afterwards, I couldn't tell if it was the cold or the adrenaline. We then packed our sleeping bags and left all of the other stuff to retrieve in the morning and began the half-mile walk back to the dirt road where Tom's car was. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that Bear stalked us all the way back to the car. When I was a kid, I went for cross-country biking nearby to our home. There is a roughly two kilometers, one, five miles loop of a forest path in the forest. It is ride-able if a bit difficult at some points. After just riding a couple of minutes on a narrow forest path, I see a figure walking ahead of me. It looks like a hooded elderly lady walking really slowly. I cannot see her face or anything, just a dark hood covering her. I recall she being very tall, but I was also just 13 years old, so she could have been normal size. I drove just behind her, but the path is too narrow to overtake her from any of her sides. Also, I get this heavy feeling on my chest telling me not to try to overtake her. I can't explain it, but something just felt very off when I got closer to her. I stop my bike and get off and watch her walk ahead of me. I then think that this is silly, and she must be startled if she turns around and sees me there. So I think to act cool and turn down to pick up a blueberry. I pick it up, raise my head back to the road ahead of me, and there is nothing. I can see the path ahead maybe 50 meters, and it's just impossible that she would have never done that distance within those five seconds I wasn't watching. I then try to reason this with and think that she must have jumped off road, since there is extremely thick bushes and I cannot see there. I felt a bit uneasy about this, but decide to continue. I ride my bike about 500 meters more, and there is a cliff where I can see down the road ahead another 500 meters. And there she is, I can see her walking there again really slowly. Again, tall figure covered in a dark hood, I cannot see her face or anything but the hood she is wearing, and she is walking slowly on the road. I really couldn't figure out how she made it there in such a short time since even I couldn't do the distance in that time, even with my bike. I am extremely alarmed at this point, but decide to continue. I drive the hill down and to the spot where I saw her before. Again, there is nothing. At this part of the forest, it is more open, and I can see quite far in any direction. 
Yet she is nowhere to be seen, and yet there she was just 30 seconds before. I continue my trip and finally finish my first loop of the trail and decide to go yet another round. After going for a couple of minutes, there she is, exactly the same spot I saw her at the first time, again tall dark hooded, walking slowly. I got totally freaked out after this, I rode off the woods as fast as I could, and in a total panic ride to my friend's home which was further away from the woods than my own home. Until today I have no idea what I saw, and it gives me the chills when I remember her figure. The moon hung low in the night sky as I stood outside the apartment building, my heart pounding with a mix of excitement and nervous anticipation. Today was the day I would join the ranks of the police force as a rookie officer. My name is Alex, and I had always dreamed of making a difference, of upholding justice in a world that seemed too often plagued by darkness. My partner for this first assignment was Detective Ryan, a seasoned veteran with a reputation for his sharp instincts and unwavering resolve. Together, we were tasked with investigating a homicide case, a daunting task for a rookie like me, but I was eager to prove myself. As we approached the apartment, a sense of unease settled in the pit of my stomach. The door was locked, a barrier between us and the truth hidden within. With a swift kick, Detective Ryan forced the door open, revealing a chilling scene that would forever be etched in my memory. There before us lay the lifeless body of the victim. It was a gruesome sight, a chilling reminder of the evil that lurked in the shadows. But what shocked us both was not just the presence of death, but the grotesque creature feasting on the remains. It was a dog-like creature, but larger, more akin to a wolf. Its hulking figure loomed over the body, its snarling face contorted with an unsettling mix of animalistic hunger and a twisted, human-like visage. The sight sent shivers down my spine, and I felt an instinctive urge to protect and serve, to rid the world of this abomination. Reacting on pure instinct, Detective Ryan and I drew our weapons and fired at the creature, hoping to neutralize the threat it posed. But the bullets seemed to have little effect. It let out a chilling growl, launching itself at us with a speed and strength that defied logic. Caught off guard, we were tackled to the ground, our bodies hitting the floor with a resounding thud. The creature slipped away from our grasp, a blur of fur and teeth, disappearing into the night before we could regain our footing. The chaos and confusion that ensued left us breathless, questioning the reality of what we had just witnessed. We exchanged bewildered glances, our faces etched with disbelief and uncertainty. Did we really see what we think we saw, or was it some hallucination brought on by exhaustion or something we inadvertently ingested? The questions lingered in the air, a heavy fog obscuring the truth. With a deep breath, Detective Ryan and I collected ourselves, determined to make sense of the inexplicable. We scoured the surroundings, searching for any trace of the creature, but it was as if it had vanished into thin air. Frustration mingled with disbelief, our minds struggling to comprehend the events that had unfolded. As we stood there, gazing into each other's eyes, a silent understanding passed between us. We may never fully understand what we witnessed that night, but we knew that our duty remained to protect the innocent, to uphold justice, and to face the darkness head-on, even when it defied explanation. In the end, we may never have a definitive answer to the question that haunted us. Did we truly encounter a monstrous being, or was it an illusion, a trick of the mind? I'm from California and I was in the northeastern corner of North Carolina the day before Thanksgiving visiting a friend. While visiting, I set out for a casual stroll to take in some of this beautiful country. There was an old church with a huge cemetery behind it featuring graves from the 1800s and beyond. I took the road north and walked down to an old wooden bridge that crossed the creek that snaked alongside the road. I thought the bridge would be private because the dirt lane on the other side led down to someone's house. But then I noticed a fire road to the left that corkscrewed up the side of the densely wooded hillside that was my route. It was steep, but the air was cool and it felt good to get some exercise. 
I was about halfway up, and I noticed an old car salvage yard in the open meadow below me, right across the road from the old church. About 30 paces later, I got a strange feeling that let me know that I was being watched. So I took two more steps up the hill and heard something sprinting across the top of that hill away from my location. But it was not the general prance like that of a deer. Rather, these steps were deliberate, heavy and lightning fast. Then there was a sound of the breaking of a large branch or a small tree. It then got deathly quiet for a few moments. I cautiously took two more steps. Then I heard faint calculated steps around the crest of the hilltop back in my direction. That strange feeling returned with a vengeance. I froze in my tracks. I was carrying a sidearm. I could hear my heartbeat in the silence. I scanned the topography of the hilltop staring from where I heard the tree break from left to my right, high and low searching for the slightest of movement. I was a sitting duck. I just had my back to whatever had the drop on me. Then I saw it. Just the upper half of a head that was the same color as the two pines it was hiding behind. The rest of the body was concealed by the large underbrush in front. It was as still as those two pine trees. The top of the head was rounded and the eyes were black as coal. The eye size was that of a 50 cent piece and about five inches apart. I don't know how long I stared at this thing, but I do remember thinking what the hell am I looking at? Then it hit me. That has got to be a Bigfoot. Well, that's enough for me, I thought, and back down the hill I went. I heard a minor disturbance in the leaves, and it was all over. I have no doubt in my mind that if that Bigfoot wanted me, he certainly could have had me. Fortunately for me, he or she was just curious. The strangest thing about this encounter is that I had no recollection of this event until several years later. My memory shook loose by reading someone else's encounter. I feel incredulous by this fact and can only resolve it as a repressed memory brought on by a traumatic event. I have read hundreds of encounters and listened to lots of testimonies as well, and feel fortunate that I was able to eventually recall the encounter. Folks, I know this might be hard to believe, but it's what I've gone through. I had just finished up with a traffic stop one night where all I found was an expired registration on a car, which did not match the plates. So I let them off without warning, went back to my cruiser to call dispatch before returning to patrol. This being said, I should have been able to see everything in front of me as clear as day, even though it was winter time and where all the trees had lost their leaves, so visibility shouldn't have been too much of an issue. My headlights illuminated almost anything within 100 yards or so, but sometimes things can hide in the shadows of those yards. I noticed something out of my peripheral vision. This is right as I was on the phone with dispatch, so I immediately cut off dispatch and began slowly driving towards where I saw whatever it was, thinking it was a person up to no good. But then I saw that it moved slowly and had a long fluid stride. Despite having no leaves, it seemed to blend in with the surroundings enough that you could just barely make out what it looked like when I saw a large head, two long ears and horns. Dark deep eye sockets that appeared almost hollow, taken up by most of my headlights illumination. By this point, I felt like Alice chasing after whatever Alice chased after into Wonderland, except without all the trippiness and trying to find an exit. Except this time, it was the one chasing after me. I sped up a bit and tried to keep it in sight, but as I got closer, it suddenly crouched down, and I lost sight of it. The more I go into detail about this experience, the deeper things get. Just know that there is no car for it to have gotten into or jump over any fence. So where did it go, whatever it was? But as soon as you stop asking questions is when they get answered. So I slowly circled around the same 100 yards again searching for anything unusual with my high beams on, on full illumination. It must have been hiding from me somehow. There was nothing except a few stray cats starting behind some trash cans on the other side of the street. I jumped some bushes and parked cars, still nothing. So I start to just go back on duty, probably looking like a crazy officer driving around aimlessly for no reason. But that's what we do sometimes in this job, you just never know when something is going to pop out, so better be safe than sorry. 
I'm about halfway down the block towards my car when suddenly, up ahead of me, which is now being obstructed by tall grass, I see it again. It had been crouched down again, but its head was now tilted upward at an angle directly towards me, and its mouth was wide open. There were no teeth visible that I could recall, and it did not appear to be making any sounds. It would only remain in that position for a few seconds, then it would slowly move from side to side before standing back up on its two legs. It was at least ten yards away from me, so I did the sensible thing, which was to get back into my car, lock the doors. But it just stood there, looking at me for a few seconds, until going back behind some other parked cars, trying to keep out of sight. I don't know what it wanted with me, but if you have watched any cop show or horror movie ever, you probably could have guessed what happened next. I got out of my vehicle, drew my firearm. I'm smart enough to realize that shooting them never works anyway, but as I was about to approach the spot where it had been standing, it suddenly appeared in front of me, stopped and stared at me. And dang it, this thing was fast. It did not make any noise, but its wide open gaping mouth, which now I can see contained what looked like rows of jagged teeth glistening with drool. Then it runs away from me again. I followed right behind it. At this point, I just really wanted to know what this thing was. So forget being scared. I probably should have just gone back into my car for that hour or two remaining of my shift. But there's a reason why they call that being stupid anyway. So I'm chasing after whatever it was, and I'm running pretty fast, but not jumping over anything. This thing was fast, like Usain Bolt fast. It did not even run in a straight line. When it ran away from me, it would just kind of weave in and out of any obstacle in front of it, which consistently mostly apart cars or trash at the time. But when you move so much while trying to evade capture, eventually you're going to fall down. Your legs can only take you so far before they get tired. That's what I think happened in this thing. It seemed to collapse on something that was invisible in my headlights, and then pulls itself back up, which I'm not sure if it tripped or why it collapsed. Maybe it was feigning death. I don't know. But as soon as it pulled itself back up, it runs into a nearby backyard, which made sense. I mean, all the streets have been blocked off at this point. So I'm going chasing after it to the same gate that is still wide open in the fence. And to my horror, I see another similar creature on my left, staring right at me like an idiot while not making any noise. It too was crouched down like something out of a prehistoric paleo zoo exhibit. Its mouth agape, but I couldn't see any teeth. I couldn't help but notice that this one had very large eyes, much larger than the other one, almost like a child or a baby compared to an adult. And then another creature just took off running while I was still trying to figure out if this creature was real or not, or was I simply running after a nightmare. And then a smaller one jumps right in front of me. Out of reaction, I shoot this one point blank in the chest several times, which my gun did not even seem to phase it. It kept on running towards me, and I panicked at this point. Despite my training, I'm now thinking that this is some kind of demon. I did not even bother shooting at it again. The first few shots seemed to have no effect. So instead of wasting bullets, I pulled out my taser and tased whatever it was, expecting it to fall over but it did not even react. The taser did nothing. Unsure of what to do at this point, I do the only thing I know I can do, run. This creature and the other two gave chase, following quickly behind each other. I made it back to my cruiser and flew out of there. And since this night, I have never seen or dealt with such a creature. But I believe that this was something that had come from deep in the pits of hell. And I know these things are very real. I've thought about this incident nearly every day for the past 20 years and still don't know exactly what happened. I believe I experienced a rip in the space-time continuum or some other less cliché version of that. All I know is that one moment the sky was blue and the next second it was night. We were staying at my grandmother's house in rural Lancaster County, Pennsylvania during the summer. When I was a kid I loved going to my grandma's because it was so different from my life in Philadelphia. So we'd been there for over a week at this point. 
I just needed to get out of the house. There was a small creek that divided the woods from the property, and there was a thick tree branch that stretched across the brook, so I could use that to hop over the water, and then also use some big rocks as additional stepping stones. I got over the stream and into the woods. I just meandered about. Many years previous, my brother and I had built a tree house, so I decided I would go and try to find it to see if it was still standing. I walked about five minutes into the woods and reached the large oak that once held our makeshift tree house. Not surprisingly, it was a total wreck and I decided that I'd be foolish to climb up there. So instead, I just started to turn around and walk back to the house. When I reached the creek, this time there was this faint white glow coming from the water. I thought it was weird looking back on it, but just figured that it was probably the angle of the sun or something. I mean the water looked normal except for the edges and the ripples almost shined and sparkled in the light. It's sort of hard to explain. Also, the stream was moving more quickly than usual, but not flooding or anything, so I had no clue why something like this would be happening. I just started to hop my way over the rocks and onto the branch bridge, but when my foot touched the far bank, I felt a flash of light overtake my vision, and I fell flat on the ground. When I opened my eyes again, I thought I'd gone blind. I honestly wondered if I had hurt my eyes somehow. The world had fallen into complete darkness, even though it couldn't have been even half past two in the afternoon. I managed to get myself back on my feet and made my way back to the house. Luckily, I knew the property well, and I made it there without incident. I flung open the door and there stood my mother and my grandmother in the kitchen. The looks on their faces were frightening. I'd never seen them with such serious expressions. My grandmother was on the phone with the police and my brother was sitting quietly on the couch. His head spun as soon as I opened the door I could tell by looking at everybody's faces that they had all been crying. Their cheeks were streaked and their eyes were red. My mom then asked me where I had been and said I knew I wasn't allowed to be gone that long. Apparently, I'd been gone for hours. I watched as her face moved between anger and being relieved to see me alive. I couldn't understand it at first because I'd only just walked five minutes into the woods, but they said they had searched and called my name and went down to the creek. But they never saw any signs of me. Nothing. I still don't know what happened, but I do believe that I somehow was caught in a time warp. There's no other explanation that's reasonable for what happened except for something supernatural. I couldn't have fallen or gotten lost because my family searched the area. They would have seen me. I didn't go far. They would have literally had to step over my body if they were in the area of that creek. It's just impossible that I was near where they were looking, and not in some otherworldly place. Still, none of them believed me and my mom was always very adamant that I do not share my story with teachers and friends. Since then, I realized that I wasn't alone in this experience after watching various videos and reading other accounts. But I'm still looking for answers. I can't easily go back there to check it out because my grandmother ended up passing away a few years ago, and after that my family sold the property. I am eventually going to contact them and see if I can go back and find answers. When I was a little kid, my mom was out of town and I was with my dad at our house. Our house was on a remote Indian reserve in Canada, and about three miles away was my grandparents' house. Our houses were separated by three large wheat fields surrounded by forest. I don't know why, but my dad got me ready at night time and we started walking on the gravel road to my grandparents' house. My mom had the vehicle with her. I was under the age of five and pretty small girl. I remember it was a clear autumn night. The wheat fields were a few weeks from being harvested, and there was a bright full moon. There wasn't a single vehicle running in miles. We started hearing something following us. It was in the ditch in the tall grass and in the wheat field. My dad held my hand as he grabbed some stones off the gravel road. He started hurling rocks into the ditch. It would run off and then start following us again. He grabbed more stones and put them in his pocket, then put me on his shoulders. I remember holding onto his forehead when I was sitting on his shoulders, and it was all sweaty. 
I wasn't scared. I was getting excited every time I spotted that thing. I could see a lot better from way up, and I could see the thing's back or shoulders moving through the grass. I'd point it out to my dad, and then he'd throw more stones at it. It kept on coming back. To make matters creepier, we took a shortcut that was along the forest line on a thin dirt road. My dad started whistling loudly for my grandparents' German Shepherd boss. The house was still far away, but we could hear boss barking and moving towards us. Whatever that was following us was still following us. That dog was such a welcoming sight to see, sniffed around both of us for a moment, then dashed off into the field barking like mad. We got to my grandparents' house, my dad told my grandparents. I fell asleep on the couch. I talked to my dad about it many years later. He said after that they had smudged. My grandparents and father believe in the old ways and think maybe it was some bad medicine spirit and prayed for protection. Whatever it was, I was the target. Predators always go for the youngest or oldest. First of all, let me clarify that this is happening at my brother's house, not mine. The house has been around a little over a hundred years. My grandparents lived there for at least 50 years. My brother and his wife bought the house when they sold it. Every time I was over there as a kid, I felt like I was being watched. The upstairs was the worst. Especially the room next to the stairs, you just feel like you're not alone. Here's what they've told me. Pretty much every single night they hear footsteps all throughout the house. If they ask whatever it is to stop, it stops immediately. One day my sister-in-law, his wife, was home alone and heard my brother's voice coming from the baby monitor on the first floor. The other two monitors were on the second floor in my niece and nephew's bedrooms. It sounded exactly like him, but she called and made sure he was at work, not at the house. One night my nephew woke up around 3 a.m. to see what he described as a dark shape of a little boy looking into his bedroom. He said the boy started running down the hall to the room by the stairs, but when my nephew went in there he was gone. He drew a picture of this little boy, but my nephew was six when it happened, he's eight now, so it was just a stick figure. The land itself used to be part of a property of a very old house up the road. I'm pretty sure they owned slaves back in the day. My first thought was maybe it's the ghost of a slave who was buried on the property, but that doesn't explain the voices right. Can ghosts mimic the living, or is this something else? What do you guys think? So two of my friends snuck out last summer and took a walk listening to music. Decided to sit down on the road and talked a bit, and they both heard a distant scream that sounded pretty similar to an elk screech, but for like one second in duration. So they turned off the music and saw a huge humanoid horse looking things sprint out of this forest into a field. And they said it was running really fast, like 40 miles per hour. They said it was kind of hunched and had a limp was lean but muscular, and was completely pale or gray and naked. They both sprinted home and FaceTimed each other. When they got home and told me and a few others about it the next day, I was in disbelief so I snuck out on my bike the next night with my other friend and met up with the two original people along with some others and went looking for it. We heard the noises they described and me and my one friend saw a pale Bigfoot-looking creature walk in front of someone's barn light like 300 yards away, but we're not sure. We continued to do this for a few nights, and one of them was walking to meet up with us alone to go looking for it, and had seen it like five times on the walk there, sometimes like 20 feet in front of him. We probably all went looking for it like six or seven times in total. The last time we went looking, we all saw it, and it was super tall, like eight, 10 feet super fast, and had these glowing eyes you could see from a mile away. I'm pretty sure I also saw it have these long, greasy locks or strands of hair about shoulder length. Looked like a mix between a crawler, a Ren Jaeger Titan form, and Jeff the Killer. It was creepy. And when it was on pavement, you could hear clopping noises like it had hooves or something. Aside from this, I was on a late-night gas station walk later that summer with two of my friends at three in the morning, 
and on our way back we saw something run or hobble across the road about 70 yards in front of us, and it looked pretty similar. However, it was much smaller, maybe 5 feet tall, but I could see it being maybe 7 feet if it was standing fully upright. Does anybody have an idea of what this massive thing could be? This was in rural Northeast Ohio. Edit. Was reading this over and forgot to add. We were walking on the way back to my friend's house one of the nights and behind somebody's house, we heard the noise of a baby crying in the woods. Couldn't have been mistaken for anything else but a baby. I did my undergrad at this tiny little college in the middle of a mountain range. Literally miles and miles of woods on every side. I think about 100 acres was technically the school's property, but except for the weird high security facility a few miles to the east, none of the neighbors cared if kids went hiking onto their property as long as they weren't destructive and wore bright colors during hunting season. Had a kid the year above me get a calf full of birdshot after running into their property with a turkey call. Anyways, the point is, there is or was a lot of woods and a lot of trail markers. My now ex, still very violent or nutty fiancé, was in a grad program in the city, so we were living apart. I was planning on going on a quick two-mile walk through the woods on a well-marked trail, just to see the lake, distress from midterms, etc. Relationship was extremely rocky at this point, and I get a phone call right before I start the trail. What it was about doesn't matter. The important part was that it was essentially a napalm bomb to the heart and my trust in humanity. Not trying to be dramatic, I was just a sensitive kid. So I took off sprinting down the trailhead, tears running down my face. Figured I'd take a slightly different trail that goes up a steep incline and maybe just burn myself out. It works, kind of. I'm catching my breath and still sobbing, and I hear a group of people on the trail headed towards me. Not wanting to be known as the crying girl in the woods and not entirely in my right mind, I took off running in a random direction, passing a lot of the tree houses and forts that people make in the woods, telling myself I know where I am and that I hike these woods often and can find my way back to either the trail entrance or to the road. I jumped two creeks, which in hindsight should have stopped me, because that meant I was straying way off campus. But I kept going, slipping on branches, and then picking a new direction to run in. I was a dumb kid. I was a really dumb kid. There were a couple turkey vultures following me which wasn't too surprising. Kids left food out pretty often so they tended to be watchful. On long hikes by myself I'd often sing to them when they tagged along. I started getting tired and slowed down to a walk, heading towards a small clearing with some toppled birch trees to sit on. My face was all messed up and my hair had little sticks and leaves in it, but I wasn't crying anymore. I lit a cigarette and stared at the ground and felt pretty damn sorry for myself. At some point I stopped feeling pretty damn sorry for myself and started feeling jumpy, kind of tingly, and everything I saw had this new level of sharpness and clarity to it. It wasn't really a feeling that I was being watched, more like I was somewhere I really, really didn't belong. It was starting to get dark, I had no cell service. The only thing I had on me besides my phone was a lighter, pack of cigarettes, and small pocket knife. Shorts, t-shirt, light windbreaker. I was literally search and rescue's worst nightmare. Trying to calm myself down, I tried to find any trail markers. None. Didn't recognize anything around me couldn't hear any running water, and was too turned around to know where the road was. It was getting pretty chilly, and the woods were starting to make that sound that I can only describe as teeming. I didn't want to wander in a random direction, but the feeling of dread kept getting stronger and stronger so I slowing started walking. Started hearing things, mostly whispers, which I figured I was hallucinating due to dehydration or exhaustion. And then the shadows. It was the strangest thing, these tall, thin shadows being cast on the trees. I would have chalked it up to the sunset, but the movement of them was unnatural, and I kept catching them in the corner of my eye. They kind of swayed, or kind of jumped. It was a strange juxtaposition between how thoroughly creeped out I was, and how pretty the sunset was that night. 
I remember looking at the sky, trying to calm myself down and pick a direction that felt right. But no direction felt right. I kept getting turned around, heard a few distinctive twig snaps in the distance. A wicked chill ran down my spine, and at this point I wasn't thinking eldritch forest elves, I was thinking bobcat or black bear. Started sniffling and crying silently again because I knew I had messed up. I was fifty shades of paranoid, dehydrated, and I pray to God hallucinating. And then I heard a rustle of wings that just about scared the shit out of me, and I looked up, and there was the vulture, just looking at me. I was so out of it that I think I asked it for help. It stared at me for a few more seconds, and then took off. It landed on a branch a few meters away and stared at me, doing the angry feather fluff thing that they do. Walked up to the tree it was perched in, and it took off again and landed on another branch a ways away. So I did what any sane person would do in that situation and followed the vulture. The feeling of dread slowly wore away and I started feeling okay. It was such a polite vulture, waiting for me to catch up and then flying off again. I don't remember how long I followed it, just that it was a while, and even when it was getting really twilight dusky out I still felt safe. I started recognizing landmarks glacial boulders, the tree forts, and could hear voices up ahead. The vulture lead me a few more meters, right onto the main trail, and then stayed put. I thanked it, apologized, and made my way towards the group of people camped out. I knew a bunch of the kids, they freaked out. I was promptly handed hot tea and french fries. They asked how the hell I made my way out there, and I just shrugged. I didn't feel like sharing about the vulture, and when I tried to spot him again, he'd flown off. Here's the real scary part of the story, though. No one realized I was gone. I lived alone, and my friends had assumed that I wasn't answering texts because I was studying. It was also a Friday, meaning that no one would have even thought it strange I was gone, as I often left to the city without telling anyone for the weekend. Essentially, no one would have even started looking until Monday, at which point I might have been either bobcat food or a sacrifice to the dear god. So thank you my kind, kind vulture friend. Vultures are hands down my favorite animals now. I recently received a telephone call from a friend of an eyewitness who was born and raised in a northwest suburb of Chicago, Illinois. The only specific location reference was given as near the Des Plaines River. The eyewitness D discussed multiple sightings from 1978 through 1988 while he lived there as a boy. The sightings would usually occur at dusk and would continue throughout the night and there were at least two winged creatures always seen flying in a wide circle at an altitude of 500-600 feet. The creatures were silhouetted against the clouds that were backlit by the city lights. The description of these creatures was that there was no head or neck that could be seen. They had long, thick tails, but no legs or feet were visible. The huge wings had no feathers, but were membraned, similar to that of a dragon or pterosaur. Apparently, the neighborhood residents were well aware of the nightly sightings. I solo sail a lot. I learned to sail when I was little and have done three transatlantic cruises so far. This one time I was doing a transatlantic crossing from the Canaries to St. Lucia. It was late and I was on deck doing an equipment check as per routine when sailing alone. So I am six days into the 14 day journey and it's just nothingness all around. I mean absolutely no light save for the stars and the moon. I can literally remember this like it was yesterday because I have never seen anything like it before. I was on deck and all of a sudden it was bright, like midday full sun bright. Mind you, it was near 2 a.m. at this point, so it made literally no sense. Immediately I assumed it had to be a flare, someone needed help. I came to a full stop, lowered the sails and began radioing on all the emergency channels in Spanish and English. I did this for almost two hours, circling around and checking the radio, there was nothing. Around the second hour I gave up, I marked the location of my search pattern and kept going. I had no idea what it was, never saw anything like it again. The whole night lit up like the sun was out for a good 3-4 seconds. 
unbelievable. Last year, my brother was driving through the dark roads of South Shore, Massachusetts, near the Bridgewater Triangle. It was dark, and there's limited street lights in the area. As he was driving, he noticed a cloaked figure standing on the tree line at the side of the road. He described it as wearing white robes and looking almost like a clansman, but without the pointy hat. As he drove by, the figure took notice and pivoted towards him very quickly, making direct eye contact. He became frightened enough that he sped away. I often wonder what he might have seen that night. Most of the town is very dense forest, and the roads are unwalkable with no shoulders, so whatever it was likely came out of the woods. It unsettles me knowing the amount of acreage it came out of and whatever this person, if it was a person, was doing on the side of the road watching cars. In July 2018, I was staying in a very isolated region with limited access behind three log gates 20 miles south of Whitethorn, California on a primitive 4x4 road. This place is at the end of the road, a lost world of primeval forest on the northern border of a vast green belt spreading from Shelter Cove on the Lost Coast east to Highway 101 and south to Fort Bragg, California. At about 3 a.m. I was awakened. It was a hot, dark and completely silent July night in these mountains. Something above my tent location, approximately two to three hundred meters, began knocking on wood. It's best described as loud wax by a big club or branch on a tree trunk. They started one knock which got my attention. There was a brief hesitation then several more knocks, but randomly timed. The knocking was loud, so loud that it echoed down the canyon in the stillness. The event lasted only a minute or two. My first thoughts were that there was no one on the mountain who could be out here in the middle of a primitive and protective area. These knocks were from something large and no North American animal could have made them. Listening intently while my mind tried to wrap around how the noise was made, I began to wonder about Bigfoot legends. The night fell silent again. Afterward, I told a few locals and learned that there had been many Bigfoot sightings near Piercy and north of Willow Creek. Fast forward to two weeks ago, while waiting at the first locked gate to the same conservation area, I heard two distinct vocalizations which cannot be explained. As I waited in the dusk for about 45 minutes, waiting to meet a party at the gate who was running late, I heard a very loud wail, scream, or call that I'd never heard before in nature. The sound was coming from the heavily wooded area above me about two to three hundred meters. I instantly knew where I had heard such an unfamiliar call about three years previous. There's a few second delay from the first call, then a few more, then silence for about a minute leading me to wonder if this whole experience was surreal. It thought that it was an unknown animal or some kind of implausible prank. It was loud and echoing down the mountain as though some huge creature could belt with the lungs of Pavarotti, only much louder. The chance of it being a prankster in this wilderness was highly unlikely. Then began another call out at about three to four hundred meters to the north. It was also just as loud but came only three calls in succession. It had a distinct higher pitch. This absolutely blew my mind because the first call might be attributed to an elk on steroids but the response brought chills down my spine. I'll never forget that second vocalization as it was so unique, and this was obviously communication between two individuals and possibly a rudimentary language. Another experience happened just the night before the dual vocalizations on a Friday evening in early November 2019. I had just moved into a cabin that my brother and I rented located along an extremely rugged canyon area of the Maddle River. It was dusk, quite dark already in the forest. I was outside looking at the stars, taking in the newness of these rugged surroundings. Suddenly, there was a screaming that was so loud and so foreboding that I could only listen in amazement. It was the loudest screaming I've ever heard. I thought it was produced by some kind of banshee from a horror film. The screaming continued at full throttle for over five minutes. I know mountain lions can scream, but nothing like this. It sounded much louder, more guttural, 
literally as if someone had set up loudspeakers and played the bloodiest scream that Hollywood could produce. I wondered if someone was up on the mountainside pranking me as a newcomer to the neighborhood. I listened for a bit then went inside and told my brother about it because it was so unnerving. Bigfoot did not ever enter my mind. But then at dusk, the very next evening, I heard two calls while waiting at the gate. I've since been over and over in my mind why have I been so lucky to hear and experience these mysterious sounds, much less three distinct vocalizations which cannot be explained in a 24-hour period. I've been to a lot of different wilderness areas during my life, but those sounds in that specific location were simply remarkable. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.